He knows the plan that he has for me, declares the Lord, to prosper you, not to harm you, to prosper you, not to harm you, to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a... Y'all don't mind if we have a little church, do you? Yeah. You might as well clap your hands wherever you are. Everybody praise the Lord. What you've been through, you know. chapter 42 verses uh, 5 and 6 out of the message translation and it reads I admit I once lived by the rumors of you 
now I have it all firsthand. From my own eyes and ears, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll never do that again. I promise I'll never again live on crust of hearsay or crumbs of rumors. It says, I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. We're in week three of this series, Soundtracks. And if it's okay with you, I want to use for a subject. I've seen it with my own eyes. Tell somebody I've seen it with my own eyes. All right. Take your seat. thank you in advance for not walking, not talking, not unnecessarily texting. If you have to pee, hold it. If you happen to be on social media, at least tag your boy and let somebody know it's going down at the city church. Ladies and gentlemen, an eyewitness is a person who has firsthand knowledge of an event from seeing it themselves. These people are often called to the court of law to give testimony about what they have seen. This is important because it's one thing to hear it. It's one thing to have read it. It's a whole other thing to be an eyewitness. That means I saw it with my own eyes. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking each and every one of you to come out of protective custody. I'm asking you to volunteer to take the witness stand to tell the whole truth. The whole truth. Nothing but the truth. So help you God. I'm asking you to be willing to testify. To testify that I have seen it with my own eyes. I've seen the power of God. I've seen the move of God. I've seen the hand of God. And you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. I've seen it with my own eyes. Tell somebody I've seen it with my own eyes. I don't know how you got here this morning, but you're here. But for somebody, it was a press this morning. You didn't know if you were going to make it. You didn't know if you feel up to it. But now you're in the room. You're starting to feel joy unspeakable, full of glory. I've seen the Spirit of God move with my own eyes. But the reality is that in itself is not just the miracle. The Bible says in Luke 22 and 32, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back to strengthen your brothers, what if I told you what you came through wasn't just about you? It was for you to tell someone else what our mighty God is able of doing. Peter Marshall said, when we long for life without difficulties, it reminds us that oak trees grow strong in contrary winds and diamonds are made under pressure. It means everything that helped you to get to where you are, it helped to make you better, it helped to make you stronger, and it helped to make you wiser. It means you have survived. Tell somebody I'm a survivor. So now that you have survived, how do we portray this last season that you most recently experienced? It was a season of being under development. It was a developmental season. It means it was, a, it was a constructing season. It was a building season. And not only has God, God Almighty, not only has God been building this space, but in building the space, he's been building our hearts. It's been a construction season. Tell somebody I'm under construction. When we look in scripture, there is a notion called the law of first mentioning. It means generally when you want to know a thing, you discover first where it was mentioned. When we see the introduction of Satan in scripture, we find him generally in the book of Genesis. It is the book of creation, the book of becoming. 
in that book, we see where Satan first shows himself as a snake in the garden. As a snake in the garden. Snake in the garden. I don't know if you've ever considered, as long as you have heard that, that ain't amazing. Because snakes belong in gardens. Our problem is we want to suggest that Satan is going to come like the big red man on a Texas Pete hot sauce bottle on a broom or a sword, and that's never the case. Because from the beginning, Scripture communicates that Satan will never show himself as a point of conflict. It's too obvious. He shows himself as a point of comfort. He is not just a dragging. The Bible says that he can transform himself to become whatever he needs to be to deceive you. Hence, he shows up the first time, not as who we think he should be, but as somebody who fits in. Now, you got to be careful because if you're not careful, you'll find yourself dating Satan because he fits in. You like him light skin with biceps and triceps. He fits in. It's just a little too obvious. He will become whatever it is that you need to make you comfortable to snake his way into your life and into your situation. He is adaptable. He doesn't show himself in the form of conflict. It's too obvious. He shows himself in the form of comfort. He rarely shows up in the form that you would commonly expect. Can I give you an example? The Bible says that Jesus had a disciple by the name of Judas. We come to find out that Judas was being used by Satan. Satan shows up in the form of disciple because it's not obvious. So if he can show up as a snake and show up as a disciple, what has he shown up as in your life? You're not even aware of it yet. Watch this. Satan cannot make you sabotage the plan of God for your life. But what he will do is deceive you into becoming a willing participant to your own demise. He cannot stop you, but he will partner with you in your own self-sabotage. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suicidal mission. It means he doesn't even have to work hard if he can get you to kill yourself. Pastor T, what are you talking about? You kill yourself every morning you wake up talking about what you can't do before you even try. You've killed yourself. You've killed yourself calling yourself what the last man called you as he walked out before you give your best self to the next man who wants to be available. It is self-sabotaging behavior. He can't stop you, but he wants to convince you that he's cunning enough to speak into your ear to partner in your own self-sabotage and demise. However, tell somebody my self-sabotaging season is over. I'm going to stop talking to myself sounding like my enemy. My self-sabotaging season is over. If nobody else is going to give me a chance, I got to give my own self a chance. Now, now, here we go, PT. All right, my self-sabotaging season is over. But clearly, like the demoniac, I've cut myself. How, how, how do I start over after I spent so much time cutting myself? All right. So this is, what, this is what the Bible says in the book of Joel, chapter 2, beginning around verse 23, 24, and 25. He says, and I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the lotus worm, the caterpillar, every creeping thing, and every flying thing. Oh, come on, Joel. Joel was so prophetic, he knew that Satan would show up in different forms. So he says, if he shows up on his belly, we got him too. But if he shows up with wings, we got that too. Every creeping thing. Why is this important? Hmm. All right, all right. So y'all don't, y'all, y'all ain't, y'all ain't got no plans. Somebody's like, we, no, put your hand down. That's, no, 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 no. Y'all don't, y'all, y'all don't. Y'all don't plant no more. Y'all don't got no garden. Anybody got a garden? Like a real garden. I ain't talking about like three plants by your bathtub (laughs) sitting over the kitchen sink. I'm talking about a legitimate garden. All right. Um, Anybody remember that show that came on on like BET? It was like a harvesting farming show. Anybody remember? What was the name of that show? 
Queen Sugar. You remember Queen Sugar? If you've watched Queen Sugar, it's all about harvesting. They tell you, you've seen them work diligently to get loans so that they can buy the seed. We buy the seed, we buy the fertilizer. We got to work. Why? Because we're expecting harvest. We got to tend to the fields because with the investment we put in, if we don't receive the harvest, there's going to be a big loss. Somebody knows what it's like to put a lot of seed in the ground. And because of seasons, everything has dried up and you have lost your harvest. Joel says, don't worry about nothing because I will restore the years that was stolen from the seed you put in the ground and the harvest you have yet to walk into. He said, it's all coming back. Here's the difference, all right? And Queen Sugar, if you've ever seen the show, you've seen how hard they've had to work the fields just to get the harvest. You're getting ready to walk into a season where you're going to find harvest without work. Yeah. He said, don't worry about nothing. I am going to restore. It doesn't mean that he's going to give you more time. He says, with the time you have left, I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly above all. I am going to blow your mind with the time that you have left. Does anybody receive that this morning? I dare you to lift your hands and say, Lord, blow my mind. Blow my mind. He says, he says, I will restore unto you. He gets down to verse 26, message translation, and you'll eat your fill of good food. You'll be full of praises to God, the God who has set you back on your heels and wonder, never again will my people be despised. He says, when I bring you out this time, you ain't ever going back to this again. It ain't ever going to be this bad again. It will never be this low again. Seasons will never be this dry again. Tell somebody I ain't going back. Here's the reality, however, ladies and gentlemen. Your elevation will be equivalent to the pain you can tolerate. So we say, Lord, I want to go higher. Lord says, you can't go that high because the higher you go, the more pain you volunteer for. And I'm only, mm, I wish above all things that you will prosper and be in health even or equal to the degree that your soul prospers. Meaning if I take you higher, I want to make sure that what I'm doing on the inside of you is going to be able to handle what I'm doing around you. Watch this. And, and, and he says, um, in order for me to take you to your next level, I got to raise your pain tolerance. All right. Maybe you don't like the prophet Joel. Um, prophet Biggie said, more money. I knew, I knew somebody would get it. Got to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Prophet Biggie said, more money, more problems. All right? So, so, so you on your ministry team, I don't, I don't like all these attitudes. I, don't like, I just don't like being around a lot of people. Can you imagine what it's like being me? So in order to go higher, you got to be able to acquiesce to the level of pain that is equivalent to that level of responsibility and or influence. Tell somebody I want to go higher. Now, if you want to go higher, you got to learn how to manage pain. And pain is developed under pressure. For those of you who know what it's like to go in the gym, you work on your bodies, you ain't ever going to come out bigger, stronger, and faster until you learn how to endure pain. You ever got under some weight and can't take no more? And a trainer says, give me two more. Didn't I just say I can't take no more? But the development comes under the pain tolerance. I'll even help you with these last two. I just need you to push through the pain. Somebody ought to receive that today. I think the Lord just told me to tell you to push through the pain. That it's getting ready to happen and you're about to walk into that next season, but you can't forfeit it by failing to push through the pain. We're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. Why is that important? Your elevation is equivalent to the level of pain that you can tolerate. Because it's one thing for you to say that you trust God. But it's another thing for God to say that he can trust you. And how does God know he can trust you? Can you keep your heart and your mind intact when you're under pressure? All right, that's a little too King James for you. I'm going to give you the PTV translation. That's the Pastor Terry Jones version. I ain't wrote it yet, but I feel it in my heart. All right, this is what the Bible says. This, this is pain under pressure, all right? Everybody don't qualify. Over, there are a lot of y'all in this room that, on this side that don't qualify. I'm just sorry. I feel it in my shine now. So you ever get up in the middle of the night, you're trying to get to the refrigerator so you can sneak two Oreo cookies 
without everybody hearing the rappling and rippling, all right? And, and you, you don't want to turn on no lights because you don't want a lot of people in your business. You eating cookies again. It's this. Then I buy the cookies. It's 3 o'clock. Who cares? All right? All right? And while you're trying to go through the dark to get to the refrigerator, you get that little pinky toe. <laughs> all right? You ain't even got no nail on it. That little. You get that little pinky toe right there on the bed rail. Now, how do you know you saved? You know you saved based upon what comes out first. Because for some of y'all, all it is is beep, 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 beep. Why? Because that pressure has produced some pain and that pain is going to reveal what's on the inside of you. And there's seasons in your life where God wants to know before I take you up, I need to look what's going on within. In order for me to see what's within, I need to know how do you handle yourself under pressure. Tell somebody it's under pressure. It means if you're in a season where you feel under pressure, it's not about you. It's about what God is getting ready to take you into. And you don't want to keep failing this test and repeating the same grade. It's promotion season. Watch this. So we find in the book of Job, the book of Job is a wisdom book. And God desires for us to have wisdom at such a degree that he orchestrates an entire section of the Bible, just the wisdom literature. And as we find in the book of Job, it, it is wisdom is godly. And, and in all you're getting, get understanding and walking in wisdom. And, and in this book of Job, we find the Job life. Someone say the Job life. The Job life is what it looks like when you have to go through circumstance not knowing why. It's one thing to go through. It's another thing to go through and don't know why you're going through. All right? All right, let me show you this. So this is what happens with Job. God is having a conversation with Satan. Says, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? God is having a conversation with Satan about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? God says, I'm recommending Job for your troubles because I trust him. God tells Satan, I trust Job. Satan tells God, I don't trust Job. God and Satan are having a conversation about Job without telling Job what he's about to go through and why. The hell is not what I'm going through. The hell is why am I in this? It's one thing to be in it. It's another thing I'm in it because of what I did. It's another thing I'm in it because of what I didn't do. It's another thing when I'm in it and I don't know why and don't feel like I deserve it. God is having a conversation with Satan. Satan is having a conversation with God. Nobody is telling Job what's going on. In some cases, you're in what you're in because God had a conversation with Satan. And Satan had a conversation with God. And neither of them clued you in on what you're going through and or why. So the question is, can you handle the pressure? Can you manage the pain that is producing what God is trying to do on the inside of you? The Bible says in Job chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. So this communicates authority. So have you ever gone into a doctor's office, and you know your doctor back there, but they this little mean mugging lady, she's an administrator, She's like, you can't go back there to see the doctor until I let you. Ma'am, I see him. He ain't doing it. You can't go back there until I let you. All right? So why is that important? Because whatever Satan desires to do in your life, he can't do it until he speaks to a heavenly administrator. So the Bible says that Satan goes up to the heavenly receptionist counter, and God says, what you been up to, cuz? So I've been around here kicking it. I just kind of been doing my thing, going to and fro, seeing who I can mess with. And God says, have you considered? It's one thing if Satan put your name in it. God said, try her. Why would the Lord do this to me? I don't deserve this. The same reason you ask why me, God says, why not you? I'm not trying to hurt you. Mm. 
This was never about God hurting you. It was proving his level of trust in you. I can trust you with this type of pressure. When you're under this weight, I still know glory is going to come out of your mouth. So I give you permission to put the weight on them because I know what the pain is going to produce. When believers are under pain, praise comes out. It is the reason week after week we've had to walk into the building and I'll tell you one more week, but to God be praised. One more week, but we give him glory and honor. One more week. Because when believers are under pressure, it produces a certain level of praise. It just ought to come out of you. It ought to come out of you. This is, this is what happened with our boy Job. The Lord said, have you considered Job? There's no one like, no. The Lord said, have you considered Job? There's no one like him in all the earth. He has a pure heart. He's an upright man. God says, have you considered Job? There ain't no more like him. He has a pure, God said, have you considered Job? Not because he's ratchet. Not because he's mean. I want you to try him because he's right. You got to redefine why you go through some of what you go through. I am in this because God can trust me with this level of pain. Are you still with me? I'm going to leave you alone shortly, I promise. He says, there is none like him uh, in the earth like him. He's blameless, upright, and, and he's a man who fears God and shuns evil. It's one thing to say you trust God. It's another thing when God can say he trusts you says in verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, here, have you not put a hedge around him? God says, I want you to try Job. You looking for somebody? Try Job, all right? He's an upright man, pure of heart. I know he's going to be good. Satan says, you know you put a hedge around him. I mean, his praise ain't that consistent. If I start to mess with some of his possessions, he's going to curse you and die. You're going to want to underline circle and no highlight that. If I begin to play with his possessions, he's going to curse you and die. He doesn't love you like that. God says, yes, he does. All right. I'm not trying to give nobody permission to play the lottery. All I'm saying is we have at least one instance in scripture where heaven is betting. And when your name came up, God said, I'm cashing in everything. I'm putting all my money on her. I know what pain is going to produce when they're under the weight. I'm cashing in on you. I'm cashing in on you. Watch this. Can we go just a little bit further? This is what the Bible says. He says, have you put a hedge around him? God says, consider Job. Satan says, I ah, play with his possessions. He's going to curse you and die. He says, after all, haven't you put a hedge around him? All right. God recommends Job. Yes. Satan says, ah, but you got a hedge around him. All right. God says, you ought to try him. Ding, ding. First time we're hearing Job. Satan says, you got a hedge around him. That means before God recommended him, Satan had already been snooping. So when God says try him, what Satan is really saying, I already tried him, but you got a hedge fence around him. Now you better be careful how you sit here in that chair thinking you got here on your own right because the old saints used to say, I'm thankful for the hedge of protection that's been around me, that's been around my house, that's been around my babies. It don't, mean, it don't mean much to you when you feel like you can't die. It don't mean much to you when you feel like can't nothing happen to you. But you wait till you get some children. And your heart is just to protect them and keep them. But they're no longer in your sight. You're going to learn how to say, Lord, I never understood what it meant. But today I'm asking, keep a hedge fence around my baby. I don't know what a hedge fence looks like. But I believe you can work a hedge fence around my baby. We're almost there. He says, uh, he says, but now stretch out your hand. Strike everything he has. He'll curse you to your face. Verse 11, underline circle, I like that. Lord said to Satan, very well, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. It communicates that God is so powerful. Before the enemy even tries to attack you, he first has to go to God for rules of engagement. 
It means these are your limitations. You can't go any further than this. Now, why does God say he, Satan can't go any further than this? It's not because you're his favorite. It's because he knows your pain tolerance. He said, I know your pain tolerance. So this is as far as you can go with them. As they mature, I might let you go further. But for today, this is as far as you go. Why? Because I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to produce something in you to prepare you for where I'm trying to get you to go. Are you still with me? We doing all right? All right. Welcome home, City Church. Why is this important? He says, pain produces. Everybody with me? We find an instance where we see what pain is producing in the life of Job. You will find that in Job chapter 1, verse 21. Are you ready with me? Are you ready to read this? Look, look on the screen if you don't have it. Job, this is what pain produces in Job's life. He had an opportunity to sit down. His children are gone. Livestock are gone. That's his way of making money. Home is gone. Cattle is gone. His financial security is gone. He has nothing left but his wife, and part of him wish he was gone. We'll get to there in a second. And here's Job's resolve. Now I think about it. Naked I came into this world, and naked I shall leave. The same one who gives is entitled to take. All right. All right. Have you ever, all right, here we go. Cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can eat. Have you ever given your children money? Go do what you want to do. Have some fun. Give some money. Then y'all riding to the store. You ain't got no cash. Hey, let me get $5. Let me get $5 from you. They like, huh, this is my money. Now, there's a whole problem. There's now a whole problem. Because although that is your money, I gave you the money. If I never gave you the money, you would have never had the money. So the one who's entitled to give is also entitled to take. Job said, naked I came in and naked I will leave. The Lord also gives and he takes away. Here's my resolve. Whatever season I'm in, blessed be the name of the Lord. Whether I'm in a given season, I will bless him. Whether I'm in a taken season, I will bless him. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise. I should have left y'all at Dilla. You ain't trying to have no church. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And if you know you're backed up on praise, I dare you to lift your hands, open up your mouth, and give God what's due him. Job, we're in Job chapter 2, right? Verse 5. Everybody with me? Oftentimes, the book of Job is so long, if you don't read the full book, there's some nuances that we skip over and we, we don't jump on. So it's like in our minds, okay, Job, uh, uh, here we go. Book of Job, Cliff Notes. Chapter 1, Satan goes to God. They make a deal. Satan goes and do his thing, and now uh, Job gets in these long comp. Oh, you missed something, though, because the Bible says in Job chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he'll surely curse you to your face. Why is this important? Because Satan goes back to God and say, yo, I fool with his possessions, I fool with his house, I fool with his cattle, all that stuff, and this dude's still serving you. But here's what I do know. If you let me get a hold of his body and let me get sickness on his body, it's going to change everything. Mm, why is that important? Satan goes and has multiple conversations with God about you. Why does he have multiple conversations with God about you? Why didn't you just say what you wanted up front? Because Satan never asks you directly for what you really want. He's conniving. So when he tells you, let me take all his stuff, it was never about your stuff. 
When he says, let me put sickness on their body, it was never about your body nor about the sickness. He wants to mute your mouth to the point that you minimize your commitment to God. What hellfire can I rain down in their life that's going to mute and water down their commitment to God? So we're reading through the book of Job. And Job, it took possessions and even with relationships. And he still never cursed God. You lost a job at Western Sizzling and cursed God. You and Job are not on the same level. You go to Chick-fil-A and they forget to give you Polynesian sauce. And you pull them back up, spin the block. Where my Polynesian at? Dope, dope, dope. You better go to Arby's. Stay away from Chick-fil-A. <laughs> I hope nobody works at Arby's. <clears throat> Why is that important? He says, when the enemy cannot get to you, when he can't get to you, he will get to whatever's closest to you. Because again, it's never about your relationship, but he will use your relationship to mute your commitment to God. How do you know that? Because the Bible continues on in Job's wife. After they have lost children, they have lost cattle, livestock, they lost their home. Job is now sick. All their servants are gone. So they're used to being served. Everybody's now gone. It's just him and his wife, but he's sick. So she now got to take care of him, scraping boils off of his body night and day when she hasn't had an opportunity to grieve her children. So what does she say? Job, why don't you just curse God and die? A lot of us send her to hell for this, but if she has to go to hell for it, You've got to go too. Because this is often the response of what happens when you can't stand the pressure. That one statement does not define who she is. It defines where she was. God Almighty. This is what we call compounding grief. It's just pain on top of pain, on top of pain, on top of pain, on top of pain, on top of pain. And I have yet to have the opportunity to process what I'm going through. And church is the one place where we don't allow people to process life. We stay little Christian colloquialisms like Jesus will fix it. And I hope he will. But for right now, I ain't trying to talk to you nor him. I love him, but I ain't feeling him right now. This is just my honest place. And even as believers, we got to give one another space to be honest. I just lost my love. I'm not happy right now. We know it's going to be all right, but for right now, I'm sitting in this and give me permission to sit. There's nothing wrong with sitting in it for a due season. What you can't do is allow that season to go longer than what it was supposed to go. Everybody with me? I don't know where that came from. That was just for you. The Bible says, Job chapter 2, verse 9, are you with me? His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. She says, Job, you still serving him? He let you? Sound like one of your cousins, right? You still going over there? You still tithing over there? You still being faithful over there? She says, curse God and die. Can I tell you one of the reasons we should take blame off of her for this statement? Because it's not original. She had a ghostwriter. Come on, Drake. Come on, Chris Brown. I'm in the room. Because <laughs> she had a ghostwriter. Those were never her original lyrics. How do you know that? Because she repeated what Satan said. If you let me deal with his possessions, won't he curse you? She says, Job, you ought to just curse him. Meaning mm, that this was never about them, but was using her to get to him. Anybody ever seen Pinocchio? Pinocchio's so dope, you think he's a real character. He was a puppet. Somebody else was pulling the strings. I'm doing so much better. So you got to be careful when you throw people away because of one thing they said when it's not in their nature. What if that was not them? It was Satan pulling strings. All right, how do you know that? 
There's an extended degree of grace. How do you know that? Because we never see in Scripture where Job divorced her because of what he said. But there was a longevity of a relationship that he says, we've been together long enough by now that I know the difference between you and the sick you. And that's the sick you talking. And I'm not going to hold you accountable. I'm not going to hold you accountable for what you said in a sick season. That's a sick you. I still love you. You better watch your mouth, though. I ain't going to lie. You better watch your mouth. I still love you. That's the sick, that's the sick you talking. That ain't you. I, be, I, I, I know your voice by now to know that ain't you. That ain't you. It's, it's, it's the sick you. Job, Job, Job never cut her off in this moment because of that statement, because that statement was not her lifestyle. It was her moment. Hmm. This is why when you engage in relationships, you need to find relationships that are Job-like for people who are not going to judge your book for one chapter. Yeah, I acted a fool in a season because of the pressure I was under. If we have to celebrate Job for how he handled the pressure, we got to give grace to his wife because she failed for a moment. This was not her lifestyle. This was her moment. This was her momentary reaction. Everybody with me? Can we go just a little bit further? Then I'll leave you alone. Watch this. In Job chapter 9, his wife said, are you still maintaining your integrity? It's compound grief. They had lost their business. Cattle, sheep, cows. They lost their support system. All their servants are now gone. Their children are gone. All this in one day. Her husband's sick. She's now the primary caregiver, which she's not used to being, and she has caregiver fatigue. Caregiver fatigue is when you are assigned to care for somebody else. And when you do it for so long, you can begin to fall under the pressure because while I'm caring for you, I'm trying to find out who's caring for me. So after I cook for you, who's going to cook for me? After I wash you, who's going to wash me? I know you're sick, but I'm sick and tired. I'm tired. Watch this. Can we go a little further? Y'all doing all right? Watch this. Here's the reality, however. Here's where we have to hold his wife accountable. Because her replenishment is her responsibility. She should have called him into the room while she ran him some warm water. And say, listen, I'm going to leave you right here in this tub. I ain't going to Tyler Perry you, but I got to. <laughs> Y'all <are> so crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to Tyler Perry you, but I am. I'm about to go walk down the street for a little bit because I need a moment. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm coming back to get you, but I need a minute right now. What does that look like? For all you people who mad at people because of what they saw when you never told them. That's immature. You should have saw it. You should have said it. It would have been a lot easier had you just told me I hurt you. It would have been a lot easier had you just told me that you were offended. It would have been a lot easier had you just told me you don't like when I do that. You can't hold me accountable for what you never say. We've been together long enough by now. You should have saw the signs. We've been together long enough by now. You should have trusted me with your words. You can't go to that next level until you allow yourself to walk in that pain tolerance. Are you with me? Am I doing all right? Job goes to this long soliloquy of scriptures. He's conversing with his friends. Then he starts having conversation with God. Like, God, why you play me like this? You ain't got no business going through this mess. Why you do this to me? And uh, God decides to pull up on him. God and a couple of angels pull up on our boy. And they spin in the block on Job. And he said, uh, Job, Job, chapter 30, 38, verse 1. He says, uh, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. You know he gangster when he speak out of the storm. He said, uh, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Who are you to come and question what I'm doing when you don't even have the vision of what I'm doing? Mm, mm, stop, 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 stop. Because we're so ready to jump into 
but God gave Job double for his trouble. But his mouth almost messed it up. So I'm asking you, what miracle is your mouth messing up, questioning God for something you can't see? Part of his plan the whole time was to multiply you, to build you, to increase you, and you had to go through the process of the pain, through the pressure. This was all a part of my plan, and you're about to mess up my plan because you're putting your mouth on something you can't see or understand. If you continue reading, we jump down to, uh, to Job chapter 42, beginning at verse 5 and 6. I'm reading this out of the message translation. And Job says, all right, all right, you got me. Hit me. Ouch. Shot me. He says this. He says, okay, I, he said, okay, stop. He says, I admit I once lived. I once lived by the rumors. The reason I was questioning you is because I was questioning where I was equal to the rumors. This is starting to look the same thing like my auntie went through. Rumors. These are not facts. This is somebody giving a third party experience when she's not even in relationship with God. So you're talking about somebody you don't even know. Now I'm taking that information, applying it to where I am, and I'm in questioning you because I don't understand. But if you saw what he saw, you would do what he did. He says, I'm sorry. I apologize. You got me. I was questioning you because I was, I was looking at you through the lens of the rumors. Here's the problem, however. Now... I've seen you with my own eyes. He says it's personal now. He says it's personal now. We are, listen to me, we are a generation, we are a generation that we have lived through faith on the coattails of our parents' testimonies. But we're coming into a season where our faith now has to be personalized. And you don't have the power of the previous generation. God! Until you can endure the pressure that they had to endure. They didn't just get here. Their pain tolerance was raised. Yeah, we got money. We got nice homes. All our bills are paid. And your children can't get along. But our grandparents would be in the projects. We all over there. And the lights get shut off. How embarrassing. And grandma would say, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And the humble shall make a boast in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Because I know what he's done for me. And the same God that put food on the table. And the same God that put clothes on your back. Why did they testify like that? Because it wasn't a, a third-hand experience. They're not telling you what they heard. Neither am I telling you what I read. But I seen them move. I seen them move. I seen them show up on my behalf. I seen the host of heaven show up for me. And if he did it then, he can do it now. I now have a first-hand experience. Tell somebody I've seen it with my own eyes. Right? Watch this. Yeah, let's go. All right, here we go. I got to get you home. Um, this is what the Bible says. Open up your Bible. Put this in your notes. Highlight this. Uh, we're in John chapter 20. Uh, we're going to look quickly at... Uh, John chapter 20, verses 25 to 29. And um, Jesus has been crucified. He's been placed in a borrowed tomb. He's raised on the third day. Before he ascends into heaven, he says, I know there's still going to be some people who don't believe. 
because they don't like to take information from third-hand experience. So Jesus says, before I leave, I got to position you to be a first-hand witness. So some disciples go running, we saw him, we saw him. And one disciple said, I ain't going to believe it until I can put my finger in his nail pierced hand. Until I can touch him in his side, I won't believe it. Finally, one day while they're gathered in the house, Jesus walks right in. Don't worry about it. Because when I said he walked right in, you thought he just bust through the door. Mm -mm. He walked through the wall. He walked straight through the wall. What's up? You got Kool-Aid in here? Play it back. <laughs> Let me reintroduce myself. My name is J to the E to the S U S. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know why I'm like this, y'all. <laughs> I promise my, my mama didn't raise me like this. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm doing right now. And, uh, and Jesus goes in that house while they're playing tongue. He says, Thomas. I just added that. I'm not even going to lie. I just added that. He said, Thomas. I hear you got my name in your mouth. He said, you've been talking about me? Streets is, I mean, it's on the streets. You've been talking about me. So you've been trying to act like it ain't real because you can't touch me. Come here. Put your hand right there. Feel that? Touch me right there. You feel that? It's like, oh my God, master. Is that beautiful? I'm so proud of you. Now that you have had an opportunity to see it with your own eyes, you have believed. But he says, I'm raising the stakes. Because for where I'm taking you, blessed is he who can believe without having to see it for themselves. Welcome home, City Church. Why is this important? Because the miracle ain't in this building. The miracle was never in the move. The miracle was over the last 10 years when you would get up at 7 o'clock on Sunday mornings flip buildings of all kinds cleaning up dirty bathrooms from parties the night before just so we can have an opportunity to worship God in the spirit of excellence and you did it without murmuring and you did it without complaining that was the miracle the miracle was when you gave and you tithed when the street started talking, saying he ain't doing nothing but taking your money. And you said, that's my man of God. I'm going to give you one pass. But the next one, you're going to get a jab on your chin. I know it because I had to go on social media, calm some of y'all down. I'm good. Ain't nobody paying my bills. I'm good. I'm straight. Y'all like, Pastor, they ain't going to be talking about you like that. I thought you told me they talked about Jesus, though. We know how to use scripture when it's convenient. Then they talk about, then they talk about Jesus, though. So I'm good. The miracle was not in this move. It was in every morning when you didn't feel like it. And you still pressed. Somebody's salvation hinges on your faithfulness and your commitment. Why? Because that is a demonstration of faith when you couldn't see. The blessing doesn't rest on those who have proof. The blessing rests on those who saw it before it ever came to be. And I want to declare over this house, you are a blessed house. Because before it ever came to be, you saw it. And you served faithfully. And you committed and the blessing of God is not only on this house, but us also on you. And everything you touch and everything you do. Because before you ever saw it manifest, you saw it in your heart. So what are we to do now? I believed in my heart and the Lord manifested to my eyes. God did it. He did it. He did it. So what do we do now? Every day, 
you find somebody who's struggling in their faith and say, let me introduce you to a man. One day I was in the same position you were in. He just moved on my behalf. And I'm not telling you what I heard. And I'm not telling you what I read. I've seen it with my own eyes. I saw the miracle with my own eyes. He multiplied with my own eyes. And if he can do it for this house, he could also do it for yours. There's, a, there's this grandmother who's elderly. She's sick. She's in the hospital on her deathbed. And they're starting to gather all the family. And uh, everybody's singing. And they're loving on her. And she noticed one of her grandbabies wasn't there. It's one of her favorite grand, grandbabies. She said, hey, baby girl's not here. Somebody call baby girl. Tell her to come. But before she comes, tell baby girl to go by my house and grab my Bible. Tell baby girl to bring my Bible to the hospital. So baby girl goes to the house, get grandma's Bible, takes grandma's Bible to the hospital and said, Grandma, I love you. I'm sorry this happened to you. Somebody told me you wanted your Bible, so I wanted to give you your Bible. She said, baby, that ain't my Bible. That Bible belongs to you now. So open that Bible up. Tell me what you see. She opened that Bible. And she see a lot of highlight. Say, Grandma, I see a lot of highlight. She said, yeah, th those highlights, those are sermons that my pastor preached. Kind of like Pastor Terry. He's a killer. I inserted that. Slow, but you're worth waiting on. He said, yeah, he's a killer. He said, uh, tell me what else you see in that Bible. I see, um, I see a lot of scriptures that are circled. What are the circled scriptures? He said, yeah, those are all the scriptures that I've memorized in my walk with God. He said, do you see anything else in that Bible? He said, yeah. I see a lot of asterisks beside the circles and the highlight. Grandma, can you tell me what the asterisks mean? He said, yeah, baby. The doctors told me I was going to die. I started going through my Bible and putting an asterisk beside certain scriptures because I know one day when grandma wasn't going to be here, you would see some of these scriptures and you wouldn't know whether to trust them or not because of the pressure you're under. But every time you see a scripture that's being highlighted and circled, but most importantly, it has an asterisk. This is grandma telling you from her deathbed, trust this one. How do you know, grandma? Because I've seen this one with my own eyes. I've seen him move this one with my own eyes. I saw him open doors and make ways with my own eyes. You don't have to question this one. Grandma saw this one lived out. But if you don't get anything from me, you don't get anything else from this experience. I seen him do it. I seen him do it. And the same grace that rests on this house is the same grace that rests on your house. And if he did it for this house, he can do it for your house. Is there anything too hard for God? Stand to your feet all across the room. If our spiritual leads would come quickly, I want you to help me. If you're here today, ladies and gentlemen, you don't know Jesus, but you want to know him. Maybe you knew him and you walked away. I want to renew my relationship with God.